So as you enter the October Gallery from the street, you see just to the right of the little stairs uh, leading to the front door, uh, a brass plaque. On this bra bla brass plaque, <laughs> um, it, it says the Institute of Ecotechnics. Institute of Ecotechnics was uh, founded as uh, our chairman, um, Dr. Mark Nelson will describe, in 1973, a group of irrationals seeking the impossible. And since then, um, as you will see those who don't know and those who do know, uh, you will have the great pleasure of hearing some tales uh, from Mark. Um, it was one, it, it achieved a number of firsts, one of the firsts was it was a catalyst for the October Gallery and one of the first um, learned or getting more learned every day institutions to combine the arts and the sciences so uh, Ecotechnics actually has a lot of events uh, held at the October Gallery in conjunction with other uh, institutions in London and such and sometimes just for crazy artists uh, or people growing ears on their chest or as an um, art scientist. So my very great pleasure to uh, present my old pal and uh, esteemed colleague, Mark Nelson. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Kathleen, for the kind introduction. I feel like I am, you know, speaking to the home crowd. I have home court advantage. Now, I, I give a lot of talks around the world. This is the first time that proper homage to my background as a taxi driver in New York is being respected, you know, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And, and maybe, you know, this will be a tale of an everyman Jewish immigrant son from Flatbush, Brooklyn, through Flushing, Queens, and how he encountered the world, and we want to definitely emphasize had a lot of fun along the way. So a little bit of theoretical background. Vladimir Vernatsky kind of revolutionized how we think about life on Earth. He was a geochemist. He taught at the Sorbonne in the, in the 20s. He went back and somehow flourished even under Stalinist uh, Soviet regime. But as he studied the Earth, he began to realize that far from being a passive passenger on the planet, Earth, the Earth's biosphere, which has evolved but has been here for three and a half billion years at least, has actually transformed. In the, and the planet that we see, the visible things that we delight in, are all the product of life. He was also a forerunner of the idea that man's power, our technology, our ability to move things and impact the planet that we live on, is now the current largest, as he called it, a geologic impact on the planet. So he laid the basis, and if, if you're following the Anthropocene, or as I, as a, a hillbilly from Brooklyn would say, Anthropocene, this is a recognition that the geologists are actually debating that we're in a new era, you know, and uh, we have to get our act together because, as Vernatsky urged us, the next stage is when we actually are conscious of our impacts and we work intelligently and cooperate with the biosphere. And the other gentleman was uh, Professor Claire Folsom, who is a mad microbiologist at the University of Hawaii. And that uh, flask that he's holding up, he is one of the pioneers in the science of closed ecological systems. So he had the, the insight, as long as you take some variety, diverse uh, microbial assemblage from land or from sea, and give it a little bit of light and don't overheat it, it will persist indefinitely. And I think between Vernatsky and really understanding the, the necessity of cooperating with the planet and Folsom and the science of closed ecological systems. These have been two threads through my life and through the life of the Institute of Ecotechnics. So as, as we will be showing, I'm not going to read the slide to you. When we founded the Institute of Ecotechnics, which was in 1973 after a few years work at Synergia Ranch in New Mexico, 
we decided that what we should take for this new discipline were like case studies. Let's go into areas where conventional economics don't work, where there's cultural conflict, and figure out projects that can be self-supporting that will both increase the biomass and diversity, restorative ecology, and also provide economic benefits for the people running the projects. So we sort of specialized in, in doing what, you know, there's really no challenge in going into a lush farm area and having a farm. So, you know, but behind the choice of the projects I'll show you was the idea that we have to do something different because the conventional isn't going to work. Now, fun part, and also really great, I have to say, you know, why was I a taxi driver in New York? Well, I'm from a Jewish immigrant family. I was supposed to become a medical doctor. The US Army wanted me to become a soldier in Vietnam. And I'm like 21 years old, and I'm thinking, I have no idea what I need to do, what I should do in life. So what was really wonderful about ecotechnics, and as Kathleen mentioned, you know, we were naive enough or far-sighted enough to say there shouldn't be a division between science and engineering and art. And in fact, what attracted me to ecotechnics was the idea that you would work on three lines of work, three lines of fun. Enterprise, because we're not supported by you know, some foundation or, or government, et cetera. We want our projects to be in the marketplace, to have interchange with local society and get feedback that way. Ecology, we want to work on where, where we have projects that our overall uh, benefit is going to be to increase the diversity and richness of the ecology. And third, theater. Which turns out, if you're doing isolated projects, if you're doing projects anywhere with a group of people, has multiple purposes. It's great psychodrama, you know, so you can take the conflicts and the frictions, and you know, somehow if you do theater, it kind of winds up into it. And so the theater of all possibility, which Catherine helped found, you know, was an important thread. And for me, I didn't want to become, you know, the choices, you know, fill in only one box. I didn't want to be a fireman, I didn't want to be a, a uh, postman, I didn't want to be an engineer, I didn't want to be a doctor, I didn't want to be a lawyer. In fact, I wanted to live a balanced, useful life. And so, you know, our motto is always, you know, if you're learning by doing, we can take, we can work with anyone. The minimum standard, which I believe I barely qualified for, was a willing and competent. We can't work with people who are unwilling, and society has means of dealing with them, but we can take in people you know, who have some background in a field that may be a you know, very advanced professional, or we can take somebody, and sometimes it works even better, if you get somebody who doesn't know how it's done, then they're more likely to come up with creative, creative ways of doing it. So from Manhattan, we go to the the wilds of New Mexico, and New Mexico, you know, especially 45 years ago, was so unknown, even in the United States, that when my mother would send me care packages of clean socks and underwear, as Jewish mothers will do, it was treated like it was going to Mexico. You know, the, the, uh, the post guys in, in New York City had never really studied a map of the United States. So, but what did, we, what did we get? We got 160 acres of typically trashed, uh, overgrazed, they had blown up a lot of the trees to plant crops in this very semi-arid environment and devastated the place. Perfect ecotechnic case study. So this was a, a view uh, of the ranch. That's an old ranch bunkhouse that we converted into our kitchen. Now it's a conference kitchen. And kind of the biggest trees, aside from a few apricots, were these dead ones. And, you know, uh, John Allen, my, my colleague and the inventor of Bias for Two, either has a great set Oklahoman sense of humor or he sees potentiality or, or a combination thereof. So after you know, passing my three-day test, my mon one-month test, he said, this is a work democracy to, you know, to be here. You have to have an area. So he said, why don't you be in charge of gardens and trees? <laughs> this, this was really fun. And uh, seriously, New York City kid, um, you know, we bought these tree seedlings 
and it is not obvious to an urbanite exactly where the root system begins. So, you know, we, we had a little trial and error as we were learning to do this. And then, you know, so th this is a reasonably current pictures of the ranch. We uh, basically transformed the place, and our motto was, you know, and historians have said, you know, in the tracks of civilization, unfortunately, of deserts, our hypothesis was we could live there intensively, have shops, do all kinds of things, and we would create a, a, an oasis. We'd actually be a positive input. So we built most of the building. We remodeled some old ones. We built a geodesic dome with the, with the blessing of Bucky Fuller, who you'll meet later in the slideshow. And I did want to point out that Judy Chili Hawes is one of the people happily shoveling horse manure into the newly planted orchard at the ranch. I'm not a gambler, but you know sometimes serendipity is really good. There was a, a horse track that only lasted for three or four years in Santa Fe, and it was very close to the ranch. So I rented a, a, a dump truck and moved probably a few hundred tons of horse manure. <laughs> And my first enterprise was actually uh, be being a woodworker, uh, a traditional Jewish, you know, think Jesus uh, occupation. <laughs> but you know, in fact, you know, we were kind of mavericks. We kind of, you know, as we say in Australia, ferals. So you know, after a while, we got rid of all of our be belt sanders because we were choking in the dust, and you know, we picked up almost anything to gouge and sculpt and have great fun making furniture. And I did want to put up the slide because, you know, this was a time of what we call biotechnic enterprises. And, you know, so we had a lot of artisan type of enterprises, maybe 10 or 15 at the time. And this also is homage to Lewis Mumford, who is the great uh, architectural critic and historian. And he wrote a very seminal book that was like a first read to people coming to our projects, Technics and Civilization beautiful history of, of technology, and he said, well, the next step is, because this technology has kind of landed on planet Earth like an alien object, is we need to make a technics that's sensitive to life, biotechnics. And, you know, that got uh, transformed by John and, and the Institute. We need to be sensitive not only to human life, but to eco, e so that's the origin of eco-technics. We need a technology that's suitable to uh, be a, a partner with our ecological systems. And I took it on to, with John's uh, in, uh, encouragement, we planted about 450 fruit trees. We put uh, a compost heap of that racetrack manure under each one of them. And, you know, we continue to work, and I, you know, I deliberately am putting them up and kind of checking the British audience somewhat. Uh, organic and maybe more importantly, orgasmic fruit and vegetables, people. You know, I think, you know, what, when it, all is said and done, your food should be exquisite. You should have absolute confidence in its safety. It should be, you know, grown locally. It should be fresh. And, you know, so one of our, uh, our partners, a, a director who now runs the Puerto Rican uh, project, uh, Sustainable Forestry, she came up with orgasmic peaches, because really the peaches that come out of our drip irrigation orchard, you know, totally beyond belief. And one of the pleasures I have as an organic farmer is going and, and having people taste our fruits and vegetables. And I have to say, you know, people get, you know, very emotional. It's like, oh my God, now I'm transported to when I was eight years old. I haven't tasted a, a real fruit like that since I grew up in Kentucky, etc. So anyway, the, the, the ranch continues. Uh, John Allen, who grew up during the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, has been the spearhead of these check dams. I mean, mostly the land is so ravaged that we're not grazing it. What we're doing is, is making simple check dams to stop the erosion and, and let the land recover. A little vision, you know, we're in the, the uh, foothills of the Srios Hills, a famous turquoise producing area. You know, and I, I'd like to say, I mean, destruction is fast. Ecological restoration is longer. But I think, you know, the 21st century could be, you know, when we start to repair the damage that was kind of unthinkingly inflicted. And this story kind of tracks my, my uh, 
reign of error. And because after nine years at the ranch, I was now from a 22-year-old, a seasoned 31-year-old, and I was sent to the outback of Australia. We have some people who've been to the project there. Really remote, I mean, think Crocodile Dundee. You know, we're talking counties that are, you know, larger than Germany, just a little bit smaller than France, with 30,000 people, half of them Aboriginal. And I think one of the visions why we want to do ecotechnic projects around the world is you really learn something by having all of your base conditions changed. So I thought I knew something about desert and dry land farming, but I knew it in temperate conditions in New Mexico. So the Australian government, in their wisdom, gave us 2,000 hectares, 5,000 acres of land that I think they might have overpriced because we had to pay $1.60 an acre to buy it because it, it was maybe the worst 5,000 acres you know, in, in the Kimberley. It had been overgrazed, it had been trampled, stock routes. You know, the, the climate there is extremely, you know, we can have, uh, uh, I'm going to do this in English, 50 or 60 inches, and we can have five inches of rainfall. Very, you know, very variable, and it's an old weather tropical soil. So how did, how did we, you know, and of course the goal was just at the ranches, how do we restore that system, make it productive, increase the carrying capacity for horses and cattle, etc. Well, you know, it, Sinegay Ranch, appropriate technology, I don't think was a term that was invented. The ranch was built on wheelbarrows and shovels. 5,000 acres, yeah, we need tractors, bulldozers, not bad, lots of farm equipment. And then we need sweat labor, sweat equity. And I have to point out, uh, who many of you at the gallery will recognize as our own Gerard Jesse Houghton, a uh, University of Cambridge graduate is out there waddle chopping with John, with John Allen. So it took an amazing amount of labor to make the transition to planting grasses and legumes, drought resistant, able to live in poor nutrient soil. That's your ex-taxi driver now feeding a seed machine. And in the background is what we call in the States a combine harvester. We needed the, those seeds both to plant up Birdwood Downs. We had a big gamble with the Australian government. If we didn't clear and plant pasture grasses on half the property, after 10 years they would just take it all over. So we had, we had an interesting gamble with the government. And you know, the, the, the objective was to turn it into what it has now become, a pastoral oasis. Some, you know, some sh shots of the architecture and you know, we decided early on, no air conditioning. You know, if you're going to live in this kind of environment, if you're in an air-conditioned, you know, house, there's just no way when you step out and it happens to be 45 Celsius, you know, in the shade, you're done. So, but we had a little lure. The early years when we needed a lot of tractor work done to clear the invasive scrub, the only thing air-conditioned were the tractors. So that kind of motivated people to do the work. So we, we invented kind of appropriate regional architecture, and we made the, you know, I think now everyone sort of understands, put greenery around your houses, especially in, in harsh climates. So there's also, there's an oasis within the overall oasis. And then a tribute to, to John and also Robin Treadwell, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. She was, she was recognized in the mid-90s as the first rural woman of the year, both in West Australia and then nationally. And by the way, they, you know, being Australia, the, the final thing was they were trying to decide, is she a feral or is she a visionary? <laughs> and I think visionary won out, although I think feral is a, a great status as well. So happily, we were able about 10 years ago to switch to solar power, and now the, the, we hardly ever run the backup generators. And some of the really important work we do, I mean, we went into this area because of cultural conflict. Half Aboriginal, very dysfunctional. I mean, the, the Aboriginals are kind of between worlds, one of the highest suicide rates in, in the world. So, very importantly, you know, kids really respond to working with, with horses and, and, and cattle, large animals. We had a big carrot 
and we, you know, we uh, worked with a lot of kids both from the local town and from Aboriginal schools on, on far-flung projects. And we've also, again, no division. We have cultural and charity events. We kind of came in, you know, I mean, a lot of us speak with my kind of a Yank accent, so we were kind of like, they welcomed us. In fact, the Australian government said, you guys have been through the civil rights thing. Maybe you can figure out, because there was almost a ra you know, racial war about to explode in the Kimberley when we got there. And our, neighbor, our closest neighbors are an Aboriginal community. So we put on art and charity events and all kinds of people come. Now we're going to take you to Puerto Rico. Did we actually start at 6.30? You about quarter hour. Oh, OK, good. All right. <laughs> How much I'm going to ramble on. Okay, so uh, yeah, again, in the idea though, we want uh, you know we want our own staff to be able to switch from running an art gallery to shoveling shit in New Mexico or anyway. Another key uh, biome to work in is the tropical rainforest, and again, you know, we had just great cooperation with the Department of Natural Resources and Forestry in Puerto Rico, and I should start this by saying Puerto Rico. Typical story, a tropical island, it was virtually all 85% covered with forest. By World War I, they had gotten down to about 15% forest cover. But since then, there's been a huge uh, flight of Puerto Ricans into the cities, not to speak of into New York and Miami. A lot of abandoned land, and Puerto Rico actually has the largest increase of forest anywhere in the world, and they have no they have no lumber wood industry. 99 point X percent of their wood comes from the United States and Canada. So they wanted an ecological project and we also wanted to demonstrate that you can take even secondary forests. A lot of our land had been cleared way back of the valuable timber, converted to coffee plantation and abandoned. And generally secondary forest is regarded as worthless because it takes so long for the trees to mature. And just, just a little overlay, like, like we like to do at, at uh, Birdwood Downs in Australia, we have kind of a control area. In fact, some of this, we're up in a mountain, basically on a mountain top uh, near, you know, not too far from the Caribbean. But two thirds of the property, we've actually left in a long term control of natural regeneration because it's just too steep. The, the danger of erosion is too great. But on the 30% that we have worked with, we worked with the forestry department and we planted 40,000 hardwood uh, trees. And how we did it, you can see in that picture in the middle, that somebody actually clearing uh, vines, you know, so that young trees have a chance. Instead of clear cutting like you would normally do, like in industrial people would do, we cut little lines through the rainforest and plant it. And when you actually look at it, we have a planting that's almost as dense as a monoculture. But in fact, we're preserving the, the secondary forest. They're helping hold the soil there. And also, the competition is telling our trees, go seek sunlight. So it, it's kind of an innovative approach to, uh, to doing this. Now, now, working with some of the great foresters of Puerto Rico, we're also doing liberation thinning, which is, you know, instead of introducing um, mahogany and maho, these beautiful woods, you know, there are a lot of beautiful native woods in the secondary forest. We're just eliminating competition and speeding up the maturation. And this project has really made waves. We're, we're kind of kick-starting a forestry industry. The University of Puerto Rico has just added forestry management to its curriculum. And we also, you know, at all of our projects, a really important thing is outreach. We've been working with the Earth Watch Institute for over 15 years, and our publications about the data is because we've had literally hundreds of people working with our staff and myself going out and measuring trees. And now a number of universities uh, uh, send students for their immersion in tropical uh, forestry. Now, here we are at the Itoba Gallery. Probably I don't need to say very much because you know what a magic space this is. But I do have to say, you know, among our, you know, far-sighted slash naive uh, ideas were, unlike old-fashioned colleges who might be in the middle of Chicago and say this is an Oak Creek. You know, ecosystem ignoring all the buildings and people 
when there are millions living there. You know, we fully under, understood, in fact, one of the most dynamic parts of the human uh, experience and impact on the planet is urban areas. And, you know, what better than an art gallery in London? This has also been a, a wonderful place. We, we've had meetings at the Royal Society and Linnaean Society, and, you know, it's, it's also a place where we try to, you know, get artists and, and scientists to work. And, you know, as, as I think every, everyone here knows, I mean, the, the overriding kind of uh, uh, purpose of the gallery in the art world is to recognize the really cutting edge avant-garde artists from cultures around the world and get them out of that, you know, ethnic art condescending box. A great artist, if they happen to be from Togo or Kenya or, you know, outer Mongolia, if they're a great artist, they're a great artist, and that's the, the criterion. And I have to say, I was here for, I think it was the 25th anniversary, and the Times had a kindly article on the gallery. We, and as we were celebrating, yeah, we made it to the Times. I know the Times now isn't what it used to be. The bloody bastard said ethnic art in there. It's like, he's just trying to be irritating. Anyway, it, it's been an amazing, uh, what's the word? Fulcrum, maelstrom of creativity, the gallery. Now the world ocean, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen to tell you about the Heraclitus. that door open in the back? Maybe you could open it for, for some ventilation. <laughs> um, so we, as, as Mark reviewed, we uh, gathered in New Mexico and bought that piece of land, and uh, we bought it in 1969, founded the Institute of Ecotechnics, had our first conferences in 1973-74, but all of the time we were contemplating um, what would be the next step, and uh, we decided, this is a loose group of people, Motley Crew, um, doing the enterprise and the ecological restoration and the theater that Mark described. Um, we decided to put a demonstration project in each of the major biomes, which is what you're seeing, but that the first project after um, the ranch uh, should be the most challenging one. So we thought if we built a ship, then we would be able to do anything, maybe go to Mars. So um, our next um, our next project was to uh, just a second was to determine what kind of ship it would be, and we needed something that was quite labor intensive and materials were cheap. And we in the end we landed on a Chinese junk, which also had that kind of poetic you know, Chinese junk sailing in the ocean is just like uh, the stuff of dreams. And ferro-cement was the material we were looking for. So people say, oh, you have a cement ship and it's actually a, a weave of uh, a metal structure with cement plastered on, but it, in fact, it's one of the strongest materials in the world. And for us, because we had no money, I think each of us brought $500 we canceled our theater tour in 1974 in, uh, in, in the summer and took our theater bus to uh, a colleague's mother's house in Berkeley, California and found uh, an abandoned marina in Oakland, California and squatted and laid our keel. Uh, so we, this was a massive kind of volunteer effort and we were doing theater at the same time and we had a cafe to support ourselves. We laid the keel and you see the, um, uh, the, the scaffolding superstructure. We tore down buildings that were condemned and we got this old growth redwood at the time. They were using that and they were just going to burn it. So our best use for that was to create this uh, scaffolding uh, and then you see just the metal wiggle bar, that's, those are kind of the ribs of the ship. And uh, in, it, it took us eight months to build, which is probably uh, a record. And uh, at the end of February 1975, uh, we launched the ship and lo and behold, you see people jumping up and down in the picture. I was on board when it was launched 
And I tell you, uh, we weren't quite sure if all of um, Freddie's calculations, the engineering calculations, actually led to proper displacement, but it, it did float. And there it is as it sa has sailed the seven seas um, uh, over 270,000 nautical miles uh, since that time. And, uh, and it's, it's really a magical thing. So it's like, um, I call it the oldest continuously floating artwork in the world. Uh, because it's really a work of sculpture. And at the same time, the um, 10 to 12 member crew on it are creating a, kind of an, a noble, piratey um, subculture, which is allied to the ancient tradition of sea people, uh, where people lived on the sea, uh, and that was their whole life. I mean, currently, uh, the expedition chief has been living on the ship for over 30 years. Um, and our captain, Klaus Tober, uh, and uh, we've sailed uh, up the Amazon, uh, 2,000 miles collecting ethnobotanical plants. I'm pointing to our colleague who did a study on Richard Evan Schultz, the founder of ethnobotany, who was our advisor on that. Uh, that in the Amazon expedition, uh, then around the tropic worlds, there was a film series, dolphins. We released the dolphins, the captive dolphins, Joe and Rosie, and they were the first dolphins to be re released into the wild, and we followed them for a while. And uh, to the Antarctic, um, uh, uh, recording uh, mating sounds of whales and the circumnavigation of South America, and then we collected uh, the coral and ocean, uh, the coral and um, fish for Biosphere 2, which Mark will tell you more about, and a 10-year coral reef expedition where we mapped reefs and assessed the health. And as you know, you must have read, coral reefs uh, all over the world are uh, bleaching and dying much, much faster. Uh, than anybody had anybody had projected, uh, and then <clears throat> the lives and legends of the Mediterranean Sea, which is an oral history uh, expedition. We recorded 150 um, coastal dwellers in the Mediterranean. Uh, ecological devastation brings cultural devastation, or the, the reverse. If your culture is corrupted, you corrupt the ecology, and so it's a study of that. And now we are in a complete rebuild of the Heraclitus. Here's an Amazon uh, picture, and the Joe and Rosie, and the ocean in Biosphere 2. Uh, this is uh, with uh, Mano Franza. This is an ecological assessment on an island um, in Brazil, in the Antarctic and uh, coming back into uh, California um, after many years for the first time back under the Golden Gate Bridge. The expedition chief, Christine Hanta, she's the one who's lived on the ship for over 30 years. And the eyes of the sea, we kind of have that um, poetic, uh, our, our, our ship, which is like a goddess. I mean, it's, it's like the ship built itself and, and in a sense she's rebuilding herself. Then uh, we, in 2012, we pulled it um, and put it into a total rebuild down to the keel. Really extreme rebuild and there was a discussion whether to rebuild or to build a new ship and it has this magic and this history and it is a loving restoration of a masterwork, a master uh, sculpture as one would restore a Leonardo or something. It's very, very special. It's the kind of ship that um, goes, it looks equally at home and strange, it, um, anchored off of an island in Papua New Guinea, or in a, 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 a super yacht harbor, or, or wherever. It kind of looks sui generis, wherever it is. Um, so uh, these were um, some of the scans of the uh, hull. And a scan by Factum Arte, the, the a very uh, the, the famous um, art fabricator by our friend Adam Lowe. 
and the, now we're rebuilding the uh, parts of the hall like the uh, Marshall Islands basket work. And voila, uh, I will turn it back over to Monsieur. All right, so uh, the land lovers take over again. Well, they did spend three glorious months on the Heraclitus in the Mediterranean. And speaking of the Mediterranean, so we have a, a project in the Mediterranean, in lovely Aix-en-Provence. And it's kind of a restoration of a beautiful ecological mini ecosystem. If you've been in Provence, you know, the little bits of vineyard and fruit, you know, some fields where you can grow wheat or corn, a little bois, little woods where you can shoot rabbits and a little oasis for birds. And unfortunately, this kind of a uh, facility, by the way, I have to point out uh, the building in, in the upper left for you, that was not a castle. That was a prosperous farmer in France 200 or 300 years ago. And we think we have progressed people. Anyway, so, so a lot of these, these uh, beautiful ecosystems are falling to suburban development, etc. And we wanted to demonstrate that we could make a viable one. We, had, we have organic uh, production there. We host uh, our own conferences and others. And you know, for many years, I mean, the Institute took it upon itself to uh, have great international, small, off the record, no media. John Whiting, who is recording uh, this talk, has been in the trenches, you know, since I think 1980 or so. Yeah, so, you know. Forever. Forever. I mean, back into the antiquities of the Bronze Age. And, and we did it, one, as an education for ourselves. I mean, you know, we had a chance to invite our heroes, you know, and, and I, I, as a German, I often was on the phone uh, now, God, it happens by fax and Skype. And to, uh, I have to say to my incredulity, a lot of the really top people, they're bored of the usual international meetings where the, the same papers are going to get presented. They want to see you know, somebody else's work. They want to see how their work connects to the larger picture. So again, in our infinite uh, uh, far-seeing way, you know, we made a point to in, in, in invite cutting-edge artists, thinkers, explorers, scientists from many fields and different people from different cultures to mix it up. Off the record, say what you will, no, we are now digitizing, but you know, really incredible. And uh, well, I'll get to a later point, but you know, we've, we had these meetings forever. Of course, Bucky Fuller, we had visited when he was teaching in Illinois, and you know, as Kathleen mentioned, I really should emphasize, we had almost no money. So in fact, a lot of the buildings that we did at Sinegia Ranch, we uh, beat the wreckers ball and, and high-graded materials out of condemned buildings. We built, I think, I think we made 40,000 adobe bricks. And fortunately, you just had to dig in the soil that we were on and a little bit of straw and sand. It's a little bit like the Pharaoh story in the Bible, if you're into such things. But you know, so we built buildings for almost nothing. So Bucky Fuller actually waived the, I think it was like two or $300 fee to put up a geodesic dome. So, you know, so this was great education for the Institute, and I think we sparked all kinds of uh, amazing connections. If you go to the IE website, I think there's lists of all the speakers, and I look back, and it's kind of awesome. Anyway, we're in the process of digitizing and putting them online to share. All right, so, you know, again, uh, working in the city. So, at the time, the Caravan of Dreams project was 1983, and the number one, you know, like, um, seri TV series was Dallas. And I think on a theater tour, you know, they were in Eastern Europe and Poland or whatever, and here are these you know, posters for Dallas. Probably nobody remembers, aside from a few little skeezers here. But anyway, you know, the unofficial motto of this thing was, let's go into Texas. Let's go into Texas, which some people consider the asshole of America, and let's see if we can raise the asshole of America one millimeter. So, uh, as a New York Times critic who covered the opening of the Caravan of Dreams, which was with Ornette Coleman, who became a good friend, actually toured a couple of times with the theater, and is a Fort Worth native, opening up the jazz club. He likened it to an F-16 landing in an African village. And I've worked all over the world, and I have to say, 
the three or four months that I was involved with the caravan, uh, both helping with the Cactus Dome on, on the top and doing avant-garde theater and approaching Texas Texans who were heavily armed, remember, on the street might have been the most difficult culture we worked on. But we wanted, you know, the point of it was also to bring life back into the typical dead downtown center of American cities. So we, we put uh, a irresistible neon array to lure our, uh, our people, you know, the, uh, the clientele upstairs, which people said they will never climb three flights of stairs, but when, when exposed to amazing neon art by Rudy Stern, a great neon artist, they just kind of levitated up there. Under the uh, fluorescent lights is a dome with, now we're in the Bible Belt, so we, you know, we had a little covert message. We had, you know, kind of a demonstration of, uh, of evolution in action, convergent evolution, you know, by picking plants from four different regions of the planet. And we had a stunning uh, jazz and blues nightclub with really top line uh, people. Catherine actually, for a number of years, had a caravan, caravan of dreams record company putting out some of the great music that happened there. And we also brought the blacks back into Fort Worth because they had very conveniently been urban renewed out of it. So having a jazz club, you know, yes, I don't mean to spell it out. And I have to say, even though the, the caravan, you know, is now reverted to a Texas steakhouse after 20 years of creative work, that revival of the downtown uh, Fort Worth is well in progress. I just pulled these images of the life that's now returned. You, originally, you had to drive 10 miles to see a movie. Nobody lived in downtown Fort Worth, and it, it was quite transformed. And then another one of our consultancies was working with a group of Tibetan refugees in Kathmandu. We, we also had our Mountain Institute of Ecotechnics conference there in 78. And we built this beautiful structure. You know, the diversity in Nepal is such, there we go. We worked with actually four, 14 different ethnic groups, you know, who specialized in beautiful uh, uh, woodwork and beautiful painting. Actually, the, the image in the middle is we, we got traditional Tibetan artists to do the roof of the, the uh, pagoda bar on the top of uh, Hotel Vajra. And we also made the building earthquake proof. And it was a pretty terrible earthquake that happened, but you know, everyone should have known. I mean, Kathmandu is subject to it, but the Hotel Vajra didn't you know, move a, a millimeter during it. And, and it's also an east-west place, so there's a great library, there's a resident theater company. At one point, we not only had the, the International Turing Theater of all possibilities, but each one of the Ecotechnic projects, including Vajra, had their resident, I'm not sure, is it Studio 11? Or something, mm -hmm. seven and nine. And this from the artist downstairs from Kathmandu. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, so they put on Western dramas. Uh, I think these images are of it's Studio uh, Ten. I think. Sorry, it's Studio Ten. Studio okay. Ten. Yeah. Okay. Ah. All right. They keep that for right. Actually, Studio Seven was Birdwood Downs in Australia, where we put on crazy outback comedies to the great delight of our Aboriginal and white uh, audiences. Okay, now we come to bias for two. Uh, which a few people have heard of, I believe. Now, I have to say, you know, in engineering, they call it reverse engineering. So if you were going to make a biosphere too, a mini biosphere, and include rainforest, desert, savanna, an ocean, uh, an organic farm, beyond an organic farm, you might actually have done everything we did in ecotechnics. So there are these synchronicities, because as far as we can tell, John Allen, uh, one of our directors and, and chief resident visionaries, is the inventor of Biosphere 2. And I swear to God, I think I was around the table when he kind of came up with the idea. But in, in fact, the entire work that we had done by you know, being ground truth and doing innovative projects in these biomes and having conferences where we met like the scientists and engineers and people familiar with the cultures, was this the perfect background? And Biosphere 2, you know, let me try to do this real briefly before I for, you know, get dazzled by the parts and don't tell you about the whole. So there are three main purposes. Uh, the first one I would say is to study biospheres. 
So we named Biosphere 2, you know, just to invite, where's Biosphere 1? You're standing in it, you're part of it. You know, and you know, we call it Biosphere 2 to emphasize there's only one that we know, and maybe we shouldn't do destructive, destructive testing on it. Uh, so by making a mini biosphere, we thought we could make a laboratory where we could really investigate in a fresh way and be small enough that you can really study it. You know, how biospheres work and how fundamental processes interact with each other. The second one was the space application. You know, and I, I still continue, as I'll tell you, uh, with uh, space life support. And for sure, when you try to put something into a spacecraft or lightweight uh, deployment, space station or the moon or Mars, it's not going to look like Biosphere 2, but what we wanted to, to kind of get the idea, both in the space community and around the world, is if we're going to actually live in space instead of taking picnic lunches out there, eventually we're going to want to live in biospheric systems. I think we're, we're kind of hardwired. I mean, biophilia is what E.O. Wilson calls it. There is a natural bonding that we have, and also the ecological resiliency and, and robustness of biospheric systems. And number three, since this was a private venture, we wanted and we knew we would have to invent environmental technologies, innovative ways to keep the air and the water and the food going. You know, so at the time we started Biosphere 2, and we started the project in 85, the construction, it's a massive uh, endeavor, took four years. But at that time, seriously, you had to, you know, people would ask you to spell the word biosphere. And sustainability, I think a few academics and ecological economics were talking about. So people told us we're 50 years ahead of the curve. I think now maybe we're only 25 years ahead. <laughs> anyway, so the, the vision of Biosphere 2 is that we would have a wilderness wing with kind of a little model, a little mesocosm, as ecologists call it, of rainforest, savanna, uh, fog desert, which, you know, because we had high humidity, a marsh system, and an ocean system with a coral reef. And then on the Anthropocene, uh, anthropogenic uh, biomes, we'd have a farm, because we had eight people, we had to feed them, and we'd have all of the water recycling, waste treatment, and all the technology, and then we'd have a little habitat, a little micro city. So that was the basic concept, and I'll take you on a little tour. Oh no, for, first we want to show you. The engineers kind of said, we could save money if we made it like a big Walmart. And we said, well, you know, I mean, we're crazy enough to be the first people to build a man-made biosphere. We're not going to make it ugly, people. So, you know, just a little tribute to the beautiful architecture that uh, our architects came up with, were kind of inspired by both Frank Lloyd Wright and, and Bucky Fuller. But I also want to make the point that not only was the architecture beautiful, but we had to rethink all of the te technology that went in there. This is a schema that, that John produced. Basically, that the two spheres that we have to get harmonious is the biosphere and the ethnosphere, the, the, which covers basically all of human culture, economics, including the technology. And just like uh, engineers look at everything that goes into a spacecraft, that it's not going to outgas things that are harmful. We had to look at all the technology and make the engineers understand you not only have to do brilliant engineering, but it has to be integratable within the biospheric system. So in you know, a little over a hectare, do we have a uh, rainforest. We, this is a view of the coral reef with a uh, wave machine by vacuum pumps so it didn't harm the, uh, the fish to produce gentle waves through it. We, on the uh, split screen here, that, that's an image of the, the mangrove system which was collected in the Everglades. And we kind of compressed, our ecologists compressed with the help of our engineers, maybe 30 to 50 miles of, of estuarine uh, wetlands all the way from fresh water to slightly salty to your red in the edge of the ocean. That was done in, in the space of about 60 or 70 meters, 200 feet. And then we had to have an agriculture, and, and I was mentioning this agriculture system, because we designed Biosphere 2 for originally for 100 years lifetime, we had to go beyond organic standards. It didn't matter if something was organic. The real question was, in this tightly sealed, 
interact with life environment, would any chemical that we use, you know, impact the water or the air? And our, our watchword inside was, whatever we put in any of the water inside Biosphere 2 will be in our cup of tea within three weeks, and that's no exaggeration. So this was regenerative agriculture. It was, you know, what's now become fashionable. We were working on cr closing the nutrient loops, you know, because we wanted this to be productive uh, indefinitely, or as is now said, sustainably. And, you know, we built, uh, because these were huge jumps into the, into the unknown, let me tell you, we built a Biosphere 2 test module, both first to figure out, you know, we, we achieved a 1% closure, I mean, only 1% per month of the air. Air molecules are a lot, you know, smaller than water molecules exchange. So, you know, we, we developed these sealing techniques, we tested life systems, and we started putting people inside. Uh, John Allen was the first, we call them vertebrate X, Y, and Z. And then later in the stage, it was kind of like being a little forlorn, and we had, well, everybody on this project, and I was director of space and earth applications, should spend 24 hours in the test module. And so I, you know, I put up my hand, and I have to say, within five minutes of being in that test module, I threw my, my hat into, I'd like to be a biospherian. Because the, if the experience of being in a closed system and actually seeing all these life forms and understanding down to the cellular level that you are part of their metabolism and they are part of yours is really pro both profound and extremely satisfying. So now, now I'm just going to quickly tell you a couple of the really cool technologies that we uh, uh, worked with. One is soil uh, or air purification using si soil biofilters, which is more known and it was originated in Germany. Biosphere 2 is the first project that actually integrated that with growing plants. And the, the, the concept is pretty simple and everyone I think understands why there are plants in restaurants and they should be in your house. But if you actually forcibly push the air through that soil, you get 50 to 100 times more uh, impact and cleaning of the air. And like every ecological system, it's so diverse in the soil that whatever, you know, the outgassing, the printers and the computers and whatever you're operating in the house and we outgas, it will accommodate to it. So it, kind of a simple but very revolutionary principle. And our product that we uh, were developing, we we're calling it the Airtron, maybe not the greatest term. And that, that was an example, that's actually the mission control building that was connected by information to the biosphere. Looks like a, a house plant, but that little extra chamber has this very simple and expensive air pump to pump up the indoor air. And indoor air can be 50 to 100 times worse than outdoor air. Then we also did constructed wetlands, and I can actually even let you read that, sorry. Uh, but it, uh, it fell to my uh, domain to become the sewage manager at Biosphere 2, which uh, I think kind of continued what I had started with the horseshit in, at Synergy <laughs> Ranch. So uh, that's me a little bit younger, in, you know, wading into the system, cutting the plants, which then fed our goats and chickens, and you know, it was this lovely cycle and you know, ladybugs and frogs found this system and made themselves merrily at home. I'll digress a little bit and get this whole slide up. So uh, after Biosphere 2, I, was, I fell so much in love both with natural wetlands, I worked a lot in the mangrove, and these constructed wetlands, and I also could see it was blowing the mind of the half a million visitors a year that were coming there to see this green, this green, beautiful tropical garden and understand it was our sewage treatment. I went back and did a master's and PhD in environmental engineering and kind of improved. There were a few problems with the Biosphere 2 system and we worked with some NASA guys. And I've had the great pleasure that this, uh, this book was, I, you know, it's kind of like ecology is everything's connected to everything. So as I, I made a business and we started uh, implementing wastewater gardens all over the world, you kind of get to see what people, I mean, they're even more devious and lying about shit than they are about sex, which is saying quite a bit. I mean, you know, so you see the most extraordinary things that people will be telling you opposite of what you can see. So uh, the original title of this book was Holy Shit. 
and publisher. Uh, and some of you know Deborah Tango Snyder said that we're not, not going to publish that. And I was also thinking about Dylan Thomas's Adventures in the Skin Trade. It's going to be Adventures in the Shit Trade. But anyway, at least we're regarding here. Preserving the Planet One Plus at a time is a pretty good title. And then we've had the great fun and adventure of being the first people to take constructed wetlands which are now in the thousands all over the planet into new areas. So this is just a little potpourri of... But the thing is, constructed wetlands are mostly done by engineers who are so boring and they know so little about ecology that they put one or two species in it. So because we worked with a really brilliant guy, Billy Wolverton at NASA, who was totally into multi-species, let this be beautiful for heaven's sake, and more ecologically diverse, that you know, that's the the path that we've pushed, experimenting a lot with uh, what kind of plants you can grow. And we have chapters in Indonesia and Bali, and we we got to put the first system into Algeria, and we made it in the shape of a crescent moon. Actually, some of you knew Rashid Qureshi, who you know, this is kind of the center of the spiritual Sufi tradition in Temesine. Uh And then we do it in cold areas, like we have a chapter in the Carpathian Mountains of Poland. So these systems can be adapted to whatever size. And okay, so you know, I, I'm kind of a sucker for impossible, implausible projects. So, you know, when a woman who lived very near the ranch got a flea, a, a, kind of a world-class photographer, that she wanted to recreate the Garden of Eden as an artistic symbol, well, that led her, of course, to the Garden of Eden down by the Tigris and the Euphrates, and lo and behold, I am getting visas to go to Iraq. And, you know, the whole story is so wild. Uh, Saddam Hussein drained those marshes because it was mostly Shiites and the rebellion started there. So it's an incredible story. They, they've now you know, restored 50% of these historic marshes, and even more importantly, the Marsh Arabs, who are one of the oldest and most unique cultures in the world, and that have now returned, probably there's a half a million of them there. So we're working with our local Iraqi partner to do these sewage treatment constructed wetlands on a five and 10,000, 20,000 person scale. And ISIS and the price of oil permitting. This may happen in the next couple of years. Anyway, back to the agriculture system. So, you know, I, I alluded, alluded to, and I, I do think, you know, I, I was really uh, so fortunate to be uh, chosen and having to have that experience. You know, so as, as you've he heard, I've been immersed in shit and soil and organic stuff and all this stuff. But, you know, there was something about actually having to grow your entire diet. You know, so our joke was, here we are in this $200 million state-of-the-art facility, and five Americans and three Europeans are now subsistence farmers. But I have to say, it's kind of one of those words that we think of with disdain. I'll tell you the satisfaction of you know, sitting down to a beautifully prepared meal and knowing everything about, you know, you could look at the rice, you could look at the peppers, the chili pepper, you know, the tomatoes, whatever. You understand, you know, you can remember planting them, weeding them, harvesting them, processing them, drying them, you know, amazing. And an amazing spur, you know, to become better farmers. A few pictures of all the things we did there. And then, uh, you know, the last part of the biosphere, two things is, we very deliberately called the crew biospherians, right? Not bionauts, econauts, etc. You know, with the obvious thing, just like Biosphere 2, oh, you know, we're in Biosphere 1, oh, they're, the eight biospherians are in there. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what was really amazing about that experience inside was, you know, that same experience I'd had in the test module, that, that feeling. That feeling, I mean, it's not just a feeling, it's not just in your head. This kind of understanding that every, literally every breath you take, you know, you are, you are taking an oxygen that these plants that you could walk around in 20 minutes and see, they're producing. You know, what you're breathing out is also eagerly awaited by those plants. You know, that amazing relationship and that we humans had new but very important roles. I really hate this attitude that, you know, we're a cancer. It's, you know, we are an evolutionary product of the biosphere. We're just learning to do it. So we had some new roles. We were the keystone predators. 
is a little analogy from ecology. We were the top species in there, and we could intervene, but we were going to intervene defending biodiversity. So if morning gl you know, glory started to go out of control in the rainforest, and we looked like we might use plants, the biospherians would come in there. You know, we're the bi biodiversity defense squad. And we also kept the machinery going. When you build a artificial biosphere, you know, a, a human-built biosphere, you know, you're excluding yourself from so many things that the biosphere does for free. So it was really satisfying. We had our role to play. And you know, we were also trying to make a point to people that living an ecological life is not like a deprivation. It's like, man, it is so cool and it's really neat. So yeah, we had spacesuits. Our Star Trek, you know, designs came from a guy who, who uh, you know, created fashion for Marilyn Monroe, and he said, you know, this project inspired her as he hadn't been since her days. You know, so we wanted to demonstrate to people that being a biospherian and, and taking care of a world was an awesome responsibility and incredible satisfaction. You know, we, we were lean on food, so, you know, like many tribal peoples, we put a little aside so we could feast once a month, <laughs> etc. And, uh, you know, so we had a very diverse uh, life inside. And, you know, again, we weren't, you know, from the ecotechnics background, we weren't going to try to imitate the terse astronaut, you know, test pilot. Yeah, make art, make music, write poems, you know, make documentary films. And then we had the great pleasure of having a couple of the first interbiospheric uh, arts festivals. And you know, we had, we had uh, you know, gone, gone in pilgrimage and got great cooperation from the Russians, the leader in the field. We also participated in scientific meetings. And, and I think one of these slides said using 21st century. It was late 20th century. The internet wasn't invented. But we had state of the art video links with the outside, etc. Skype didn't exist yet. So, you know, it was a wonderful meditation, you know, that one slide. We realized our limiting factor was the amount of sunlight coming through the, the building. So, you know, uh, we called it Victory Gardens. This was when so many Americans went off to be farmers in World War II. The government encouraged people, plant little gardens, you know, and I think 30 or 40 percent of America's food was done. So we basically packed the biosphere with plants and you know kind of an analogy with the current uh, challenge we were actually every day the, the hot button topic is what's the co2 level here so we were active participants in managing our atmosphere does this sound prescient uh, you know and this is back in in the 1920s when this wasn't on everyone's lips and I think one of the greatest things we did is you know somehow we we captured the world's imagination and you know, I'm told that our re-entry was beamed out to something like 800 or 900 million people. So that image, and Biosphere 2, you know, was an experiment, first and foremost. Whatever you've read about it, an experiment is only not successful if you don't learn. So we learned from a lot of the unexpected things that happened, and we were surprised about how much work is as promised. But the basic premise was kind of the ultimate ecotechnic test. Can we actually intelligently design a technosphere, including farm and all the machinery you need in an artificial world, and have everything thrive? And you know, between the, when we came in and two years later when we left, trees grew from six and seven feet, or two meters, to like seven, eight meters. You know, life flourished inside Biosphere 2, as, as did the Biospherians. We came out a little leaner. So re-entry, uh, you know, and then, you know, coming out was quite the experience because, you, you know, we were adapted to living inside Biosphere 2. I worked on the transition, most people don't remember. There was a second crew that was inside for about seven months. The project has now gone on other, uh, other journeys, but it's kind of deepened my appreciation that 
the real issue, you know, it's kind of like the Buddha said, you know, the first thing you have to do is you have to change the way you think about things. So, you know, unfortunately, when people survey, uh, you know, humans on this planet, most of them still think that they are kind of like spectators or, you know, they're not really involved. Ecology is somewhere else and the biosphere is somewhere else. You know, so that's a fantasy. That's illusion. And it's a dangerous illusion because, you know, we're the children of the Anthropocene and we have to really take stock, maybe reinvent how we do technology, insist that our, our food be clean and healthy and natural, and, you know, insist that our air, which is really unacceptable in cities, uh, and our water be really clean. And all that technology, anything that humans have done can be, you know, changed, can be engineered in a better way. So it has been kind of my meditation is how do you do that? And one of the reasons I like the constructed wetlands was just in one place we're going to connect people to, you know, knowing where the water comes from and the open tap and where does their feces and urine, as the scientists say, go when they flush the toilet. And if it's going out to a beautiful tropical garden instead of out into the coral reef that you're about to go snorkel or dive into, people love it. They love that they're part of a loop that makes sense that you know no harm is being done. So we've continued in, in closed ecological systems. This is an image of what we're calling kind of a modular biosphere or the laboratory biosphere that we built at Cynthia Ranch and, and studied uh, for a number of years. At the time it was built, it was one of the, the largest closed systems in the world. And I continue in the field. I go to Coast Farm meetings presenting papers and you know this is kind of like uh, some of the leaders of the uh, worldwide uh, uh, international effort to create life support systems for space, which will obviously have big human impacts. And I'd like to point out, a little dyslexic, the guy on your left actually was a Chinese uh, PhD student who had come out of 105 days in the Lunar Palace in China, who are really pushing the envelope in uh, Next to him is, is one of the uh, Soviet, now Russian scientists who did the groundbreaking work in Siberia. In the middle is the guy who, who uh, is the head of the Melissa, the flagship of the European Space Agency. And, and next to me is Ray Wheeler, the head of NASA's program. And the Chinese actually are so into this that they have two groups. So the guy on the far side is, is also doing incredible work in life support. So basically, the you know kind of the the punchline is you know our our effort multiplied by all the other people who are manifold all over the planet, you know is is asserting that ecotechnics, which seemed kind of far out when we first invented the word, now eco and technics is not such an unusual thing, and biospherics are key tools in the challenge we face, which is to become intelligent biospherians of a thriving planet. Thank you. Wastewater Garden book uh, is on sale downstairs, those of you who didn't pick it up on the way in, and John Allen's Me and the Biosphere is uh, on sale as well uh, for uh, a period of time after this. We can take a couple of questions. Or comments. Or comments. <laughs> thank you very much. It was an absolutely magnificent talk. Thank you. I was one of the millions who came to see the Biosphere too. Um, and there's a book I believe written after about the tensions and conflicts amongst the people inside. I haven't read that, but I wonder if you could say something about that. Oh, I can say a lot. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm still processing that. Okay. Uh, you know, we kind of knew that that would be a, a real challenge, obviously. You know, and if you read the accounts, the, the explorers, and of course the, the RGS here is a flagship of, of world exploration. It's such a common syndrome, they call it explorer's cholera. 
But you know, there's cabin fever, there's the usual, you know, gossip and jealousy, and I, I hang out better with Joe and Jill. I think what ex exacerbated things, so we knew that was going to happen. Uh, there was a power struggle which you know, resulted in Columbia University, now the University of Arizona, managing, and thank God the Bicester is still there. If you're in Arizona, you absolutely should go and see it. You can now actually go through it because it's not a closed system. But the power struggle, I think, exacerbated. You know, one is people in, in those circumstances, they also exaggerate. Oh, people exaggerate their problems sometimes. So, you know, uh, the, our management, thank God, because it's more useful data, you know, when rumors were flying that we were all going nuts and, you know, about to kill each other, they brought in some environmental psychologists and the head shrink, the, the head of the psychiatry department at the local medical school. And, you know, so we tested, you know, really kind of interestingly, I didn't make the point, but we wanted to also send a symbol. You know, unlike the British, who I think only fairly recently have sent women down to Antarctica, we, you know, a um, design criterion was a crew of four men and four women and what they did with themselves was kind of their own uh, personal concern. But it was interesting, the men and the women tested apparently very much in the explorer's uh, type and very much like uh, shuttle or other astronauts. And our shrink, who did private sessions with everyone, said, you know, at the end when he got us all together on a collective uh, call, he said, you guys are not only in good mental health, I have to tell you, if I'm lost in the jungle in Borneo or the Amazon and I needed eight people to get me out alive, yeah. I, I'd pick you. So sometimes your subjective opinion, and, and the other just little anecdote is, you know, we really struggled. We had two El Nino years, which meant more cloud to produce abundant food. It was delicious and very varied. But every time we had a special feast, which you know we made sure was at least once a month, you know we invented holidays when months didn't have them. Whenever we had a special feast or a, a cup of coffee from the rainforest, all of the group tension absolutely magically <laughs> disappeared. It was like we're not going to ruin this with our you know petty crap. And the other thing which I really have reflected on a lot is that it was unthinkable. Nobody sabotaged anyone else's work. And nobody, I mean, it was an I impossible concept that would actually sabotage or do anything that hurt the health of the biosphere. I mean, that reality that this is our lo living lifeboat kind of overrode all of that. Any, anyone else? Yeah. yeah, thank you for an extremely interesting presentation. Um, my question is, we are facing um, constantly, daily, new information about the uh, state of Biosphere 1. And um, after 40, well, after 43 years that you've been active in different areas with the different projects of the Global Technics Institute, um, what's your feeling about the situation? Can you give us some positive, <laughs> inspiring? I'm pretty much only going to give you something positive because I think optimism is a yoga that we all need to, it's too easy to be gloom and doom. And, because one, that vitiates you. The, you know, the other thing, and it, it, it sounds really trite, I have to say, but, you know, Biosphere 2 was so sensitive. You know, uh, we were tracking, we had an analytic laboratory in there, but there was a little bottle of glue. We had a couple of technogenic, you know, uh, technology release gases that were increasing in concentration. We found out it's a huge structure didn't point out, but you can kind of tell it's like 27 meters to the top of the rainforest. Fast, I mean, for a human construction. We found in a technical basement of Biosphere 2, kind of in a dark corner, a bottle that had been improperly screwed down. And because it was cross-threaded a little, and we're talking a bottle this big. You know, so we kind of, you know, had this watchword Every action that we do, there are no small action. I think in, in theaters where there are no small actors, or, uh, no, there's, there are no small roles, only small actors. Kind of the same thing. Every action that we do is important. Now, I think the wonderful thing about Biosphere 2 is that we understood, you know, our life and the life of this biosphere it was, you know, it was cellularly understood are the same. So one, I think we have to be optimistic, but. You know, I started going to Russia, you know, to the Soviet Union in 1985, 
And if you told me, you know, while we were inside, I think it was the first Christmas, Gorbachev got on t Russian TV and said, it's over, it's over, kids. You know, paradigms change. You know, so yes, I mean, it's a, it's a grave situation. But I think, you know, clearly there is a vast increase in ecological understanding. And again, you know, when I look at young people and speak to young people, and I've had the pleasure, you know, because I get to crazy places on crazy projects, of going into little Indian uh, coffee producing villages in, in the Yucatan or in uh, other parts of Mexico. And these kids have seen Biosphere 2. You know, so, you know, what it's going to take is people, one, understanding that, you know, this is, this is our job now. And this is our responsibility, and it, it is such a great thing to understand that we are part of this biosphere. And there's so many countless things that are happening. I mean, I'd like to also remind people, we tend to look at the world around us and think this is the way it is, this is the way it has to be. So I wanted to bring in that Anthropocene, kind of, you know, the reminder that, you know, here we are in the country where the Industrial Revolution began. It only began 200 years ago. 200 years, 300 years ago, and did nothing, and I blink. And technological choices were made without understanding the consequences. And I, I, you know, a symbol that many people have pointed to, in the 19th century, it was a point of civic pride that you had big factories and belching smokestacks. That meant you were modern and prosperous, and no one had any idea that we little humans could actually change the atmosphere, endanger the ocean. So, yeah, it's a grave situation. I don't think it's hopeless, you know, and there's, there's more reasons to be optimistic. One is that's going to motivate you to do whatever you can do, beginning by really understanding and, and, you know, it's a wonderful realization. I am part of this biosphere. You know, study about it, think about it, go out in nature and experience that bonding that we have. And, and you know, greening of cities, locavores, Slow food, you know, there, there's, you know, there's untold. Our newspapers and media, who are owned by the usual suspects, you know, who have a vested interest in the usual bad technologies, they only give us the bad news. So I, I know, you know, you, Chris, are you working? You know, there's so many people working in their ways to push that paradigm. Thank you. Okay, um, one, one more. I just want to say on that that um, you mentioned that it was designed for, the Biosphere 2 is designed for 100 years, but also that there would be multiple uh, modeled systems, biospheric systems, and one in each major university, in each town square, you kind of need many of them in order to understand different permutations of technology and plants and, and, and so on. We were just, some of us were at a um, European Space Agency meeting and basically everybody there was saying the thing, same thing, we need more um, biosphere laboratories on the order of biosphere two, perhaps not as big. Right. As Mark mentioned, I was involved in the recording of a lot of these conferences back in the 19, early 1980s. Not only that, but I had a recording studio that occupied most of the basement here for 20 years, for around 1980 at the turn of the century. I had a chance to, well, and before that, 30 years before that, I had done my uh, MA thesis on the history of money and what the, the effect that money had on the destruction of civilizations and organizations. And for 20 years, I had a chance to be a living observer, a fly on the wall of this organization. And the thing that struck me in that whole time was nobody was traveling back and forth at first class. Nobody was accumulating uh, 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 personal funds uh, in, the, in the offshore islands. And as a res I think that as a result of that, that this is one of the very, very few organizations set up idealistically back and close to the middle of, of the uh, uh, of the you know, of the of this last century that has survived 
and prospered. All the rest of them that I know of, and I was associated with one or two, such as Pacific Radio, wonderful organization, went straight downhill when people started uh, uh, accumulating money personally. And I want to thank the Institute for <laughs> giving me a faith in the potential of humanity, which uh, I have rarely observed anywhere else. Thank you.